institutions associated with Shakespeare are Alton Trier, of course, Shakespeare's Globe, Shakespeare's Request Trust, that is advertising a selfie with Shakespeare um, and contest um, here, um, the British uh, Library, um, the BBC Shakespeare uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Folger Library in the United States, and um, uh, Shakespeare Argentina um, also have uh, a presence on Twitter. Tourism associated with Shakespeare is also represented in Shakespeare Country. Discover the wonders of Shakespeare Country and explore England's England. I like that. England's England. <laughs> uh, and then also, of course, uh, Shakespeare's, uh, uh, Shakespeare's England. Um, there are accounts for magazines and journals associated with Shakespeare, such as the Shakespeare Standard um, and Shakespeare Magazine. Uh, which seeks to share even more information about Shakespeare. You can read the magazine, you can follow the Twitter account, you can look at the website, you can find out so much more. There are accounts where people play with Shakespearean language and ideas, such as the improvised uh, Shakespeare Company and improv group that uses audience suggestions to create a full Elizabethan style play, uh, and there's Shakespeare that condenses Shakespeare in the spirit of uh, Groucho Marx, um, and they use their Twitter account not only to advertise their performances, but to also put up little snippets um, of their performances there. And then there is a Pop Shakespeare, which this is an example of, and Shakespeare lyrics, which take contemporary song lyrics and turn them into the uh, language of, uh, of Shakespeare here. And um, so uh, we have uh, Cause Uptown Funk, then I give it to the Saturday evening and we gather on the spot. Don't believe with me, just gaze. <laughs> <laughs> and it posts um, every day. So every day you can get um, a contemporary lyric Shakespeareanized. There is also Everyday Shakespeare. Um, where two professors take the bar down from the ivory tower, plus cocktails. Our book, uh, Shakespeare Not Stirred, Cocktails for Your Everyday Drama, just was produced by Penguin in 2015. Um, they have the recipes up there and other things that show Shakespeare in um, an unusual uh, uh, setting, sometimes contemporary, but not It's a Shakespeare. This is the uh, Shakespeare geek who proclaims that Shakespeare makes life better. And uh, his Twitter account links to his Shakespeare uh, blog. And if you have not uh, seen the New Yorker's Donald Trump performs Shakespeare's soliloquy, <laughs> <laughs> I can highly recommend it. That's the bottom uh, time right there. Just type it in, Donald Trump. Shakespeare. Um, and the uh, Shakespeare Geek, uh, through both Twitter and his blog, will answer questions for students. Um, and that leads me to Twitter accounts uh, that are based on learning and sometimes learning about Shakespeare. Uh, the BBC Learning English um, um, uh, Twitter account is named uh, Shakespeare Speaks. And um, it has lots and lots of information about learning Shakespeare, but about once a week, they will post something like, have you ever got yourself in a pickle? Um, a phrase common in um, English that generates from Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare at play. Uh, and this is a tweet about Shakespeare at play. Shakespeare at play does have its own Twitter account. Uh, it is an, an iPad app for teaching Shakespeare, uh, and it is um, every character, every scene, every line in full video so that you can show uh, your students, um, or watch yourself, um, a, a performance of Shakespeare. It's, it's pretty, uh, I mean, it's dramatized. The, the actors are playing the part. It's not just a reading of it, um, but it is every line, every scene. So not a production that would uh, uh, normally 
um, do that. Um, the, uh, the Twitter account associated with this uh, gives uh, behind the scenes stories and pictures, announces new releases, and allows a place for public feedback um, and discussion. Then there is Shakespeare 300, which also supports an app for um, iOS or Android uh, that provides all you need to know before the curtain goes up or the test goes down. <laughs> uh, and you know, so once again, um, it uh, the, the app itself uh, tells you about the um, uh, about the plays and uh, the the Twitter feed, the Twitter account. Um, gives you uh, additional information um, about Shakespeare and some, and some fun stuff um, about Shakespeare. And she could resist. <laughs> Shakes, at Shakespeare Pumps, the Twitter handle, uh, the Stratford on Avon by Dogs, and the organization uh, names all of its puppies after Shakespeare uh, characters. And they were nominated for a um, Citizen of the Year Award at the Pride of Stratford. Um, uh, convention just last Wednesday. And of course, of course, there must be an at Shakespeare cat on Twitter. Um, and uh, once again, every day you can get on your Twitter account uh, a charming picture of a cat um, connected to Shakespeare and uh, a Shakespeare um, a Shakespeare. Quote. However, <laughs> to go to two um, uh, very important um, uh, institutions in the perpetuation of uh, Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's uh, library, the British Library, and the Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, Kate Rumble discusses in her article from Access to Creativity, Shakespeare's Institutions, New Media, and the Language of Cultural Values. Um, all the Twitter accounts, Facebook pages, um, YouTube channels, Instagram accounts are not just because all these venerable Shakespeare affiliated institutions have decided to embrace social media. Uh, there have been compelling reasons uh, for them to do so as both government policy and granting institutions have demanded that cultural institutions show that they are not only accessible and utilized by people, but that people are engaged and actively participating in the institution. As I just demonstrated, Twitter accounts generate quantifiable data. You can see how many people are following the account, how often it tweets, how much it is retweeted. All of that is easily accessible there. In 2006, um, David Lammy, then serving as the Minister for Culture in Tony Blair's government, proclaimed that cultural institutions receiving support from the government, such as the British Library and the Royal Shakespeare Company, should uh, confront the test of moving from a cultural framework that guarantees the right of access to one in which regular and sustained participation is the norm. The language of funding, whether government funding uh, or private granting agencies, changed from access to participation and engagement. In the British government's 2008 report, Creative Britain, cultural organizations are reconceived as the key that unlocks creative uh, talents opening up individuals to the possibility of a future career in the creative industries. A similar change has taken place in the United States as the National Endowment for the Arts uses the language of engagement and creativity, both in the titles of various programs and in the evaluation of the program. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts has categories for organizations named Creativity Connects Project, and Our Town Arts Engagement and Cultural Planning, and Our Town Projects that Build Knowledge About Creative Placemaking. The National Endowment for Humanities also uses the language of engagement and creativity and its implementation grants for museums, libraries, and cultural organizations. Quote, this grant program supports projects from general audiences that encourage active engagement with the humanities ideas in creative and appealing ways. Uh, Shakespeare's World is a project of the uh, Folger Library that definitely encourages engagement, participation, and creativity. It asks, it's a, it's a crowdsourcing uh, uh, transcription uh, program uh, that asks people to 
um, actively transcribe from a handwritten text um, into a, digiti, a digitally um, created, readable, scannable, um, um, scannable text um, there. And of course, they can easily count that participation, that creativity, and the engagement. Okay. The Folger Library is um, also sponsoring the Share Your Shakespeare Story using the hashtag um, MyShakespeare400. Um, They're asking people to create a video discussing um, their relationship with Shakespeare. They're asking them to up share the video. They're asking them you to tag your friends. And they are asking you to um, use their hashtag so they can say, see how many people participated, engaged, and created um, along with this. That same basic idea is also being promoted in a slightly more dramatic fashion uh, skull, uh, by the Shakespeare Theater Association using the hashtag um, Legacy uh, 400. And the Chicago's year-long Shakespeare 400 celebration um, has its own uh, Twitter handle, Shakespeare 400, as well. Okay. Although the internet can promote values such as interactivity, participation, creativity, it can also give uh, an impression of these values with little actual substance here. Um, does social media break down the symbolic separation of art from social media? Uh, is something that I think um, scholars in the future will need to, to address. I want to conclude by talking about a truly disruptive and transformative use of uh, Shakespeare and social media um, and, and hashtags such tweeting stuff. Beginning in April of 2010, when Twitter was all of three years old, um, six Royal Shakespeare Company actors began a five-week real-time performance of Romeo and Juliet via Twitter entitled Such Tweets of Sorrow. The actors performed their characters on Twitter using the social network site to communicate with the other characters, react to real-world events, 21st century real-world events, um, and respond to other Twitter users throughout their performance. Um, such Tweet Sorrow was advertised on the performance website as taking place um, at the time it would take in real life, emphasizing the live events that were to unfold between the characters um, over those um, five, uh, five weeks. Um, the Royal Shakespeare Company teamed up with writers from the cross-platform production company Medlark, and together they envisioned a specific approach for the performance. Uh, this was uh, what was put up on the website about it. Where this Twitter play differed from other similar attempts at using the microblogging medium as a storytelling platform was in its narrative structure. Uh, celebrated online storyteller Tim Wright and playwright Bethan Marla collaborated on a story grid where the characters' lives are mapped out over the five weeks. There was no direct use of Shakespeare's words, no word for art thou. Um, at Romeo. Uh, the characters tweeted as normal people would do. Uh, Juliet tweets were quick and often. Her elder sister <coughs> nurse Jess's more mature and reflective. Okay. Um, the performance unfolded through Twitter accounts of six characters Romeo, <coughs> Juliet, Mercutio, uh, nurse uh, Jess, who was Juliet and Tybalt's um, older sister and kind of fulfilled the role of the nurse uh, in. The, um, Shakespeare's uh, Romeo and Juliet, um, and Friar Lawrence. Each character established an individual Twitter account, interacting with one another and the audience while adapting to the conventions um, of the site. Only a few of the characters, Mercutio, Jess, and Tybalt, began the performance as active Twitter users, and they signaled their active status through the use of common user conventions or twin, uh, trends. Um, they were experienced, I'm um, sure the actors themselves are experienced career users. Um, they posted uh, photographs, they, um, they sent um, individual 
uh, this response of when Juliet finally, uh, when Juliet joined the conversation a day later, um, it was very clear that she was an inexperienced Twitter user and she was being sort of coached um, 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 to, uh, to do that. Um, uh, they were became active participants on the social uh, platform site by using, um, they allow the audience to participate seamlessly on the online uh, performance um, as well. The audience's participation was not only encouraged but reciprocated as the characters would respond to other users, retweet their information, uh, and engage in back and forth uh, dialogue on specific issues. One of the sort of plots of the, um, of the play was. Um, um, to uh, determine what would be the theme of Juliet's Sweet 16 birthday party. And so there was active engagement from the audience um, of, this, um, of, this, of this Twitter um, account. Um, and uh, therefore, using the, uh, this account um, allowed for sort of a mediated performance, but not like a live, it was on for five weeks, it was live. Uh, but also a digitized, um, uh, a digitized performance. Um, a similar uh, experiment was done by theater professor Norman Ferguson at Georgia State uh, University uh, doing Hamlet uh, in 2013. Um, every uh, actor, every character created a Facebook page and a Twitter account. And uh, a difference was instead of going over for five weeks, um, they did. Uh, uh, they, they set up the, the Facebook accounts and the, um, uh, and the and the Twitter accounts, but then they actually did a performance. And during the performance, they were responding in real time um, to uh, posts on their Facebook page, uh, both from characters and from audience uh, audience members um, only. Um, does this show? Does the social media on Shakespeare show that Shakespeare has not disappeared from American culture. That is the hashtag question. <laughs> 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 Thank you. My paper is a bit unconventional, as you saw. The title is Our Theory of Adaptations on American Radio. Um, this is a chapter, a watered down chapter from my book, Radio Adaptations of Arthurian Lit and Robin Hood. And I became a kind of a radio fan a few years ago and uh, took an adaptations course and ended up writing a paper that was uh, published on radio adaptations of Robin Hood and looking at the political history of Robin Hood. Well, during dissertation, and that kind of led me to Arthurian lit as well. And um, the offshoot is medievalism and also adaptation. So there's a lot going on here. Um, for the sake of the audience, which I, I would assume no one knows anything about American radio, I will provide you with some background, some background history on American radio and also some historical context for the, uh, for the topic of the paper. I also have a segment from the Superman episode um, if you're interested in hearing it, I can play it when the session's over, when the questions have been answered, because I don't know how much time we'll have left. <clears throat> can you hear me okay without the microphone? Hopefully. Good. Okay. So uh, the title is Superman Meets the Clan, an American radio adaptation of Arthurian legend. The Adventures of Superman and the Knights of the White Carnation. In the United States in the 1930s and 1940s, sorry, <laughs> fascist organizations, um, including the Klan, were stirring trouble. Radio scriptwriters reacted, though in many cases without the support of their networks, by producing storylines for radio dramas addressing prejudice to teach tolerance. Robert Maxwell, a producer of the radio series The Adventures of Superman, broadcast on the Mutual Network, considered his radio series a public service in Superman America's Moral Compass. As part of the radio campaign to combat prejudice, Maxwell produced a series of timely Superman episodes he called Operation Toleration to expose the radio audience to the dangers of prejudice. Maxwell's 1946 campaign was a blatant attack on the Klan, and The Adventures of Superman became the first radio series to take on prejudice in this manner. 
Maxwell titled the series of Operation Intoleration Episodes, The Clan of the Fiery Cross, The Hate Mongers Organization, and The Knights of the White Carnation. This paper examines Knights of the White Carnation as a modern allegory and a cautionary tale about the dangers of prejudice and as an example of medievalism. Our theory of legend has been a favorite source for adapters of all mediums, including radio. In many, many adaptations, the Arthurian knight practices chivalry as a standard of behavior. And in the modern imagination, the knight's code, of course, is illustrated in good leadership, in loyalty, duty, and is, of course, tied to the Christian ideal. Um, the Arthurian legend uh, could also, as we find in history, serve a, a darker agenda with the um, appropriation and adaptation by the Nazi party and the Klan to inspire radical nationalism, which is also illustrated in this particular program. This engagement with the Middle Ages and the adaptation of some aspect of the medieval, such as coding a medieval storyline in contemporary anxieties, as, Ma as Maxwell does in Knights of the White Carnation, is an example of medievalism. The Nazi party engaged with medievalism when it located the origins of the SF in the Shellwork Middle Ages and promoted a racial theory that identified knighthood as a genealogy of the blood and demanded the ruthless destruction of all those who uh, posed the threat of contamination, according to Laurie Binky. In their examination of the Nazis' appropriation of Arthurian history, Binky suggests um, that though Hitler and his followers identified themselves with knights, medieval knights could not possibly have conceived of themselves conceived of themselves as fascists. On radio, the knight was a superhero named Superman, a detective called the Saint, a cowboy named Paladin, or an American boy named Jack Armstrong. They all demonstrated bravery, bravery loyalty, courtesy, truthfulness, and defended the oppressed. Because of the flexibility and popularity of the Arthurian legend, it proved ideal for radio and was adapted for every genre enjoyed by children and adults, the drama, the western, the adventure series, variety shows, and juvenile programming. The Middle Ages was also an ideal setting for the oral medium. Vivid descriptions and complex sound effects and music recreated the Middle Ages in the listener's theater of the mind. The sound of galloping horses' hooves, the notes of a trumpet, the clash of steel, evoked images of armored knights participating in a jousting match, while the medieval force was conveyed in the sounds of twitting birds and rushing water. Chivalric conduct, which is something that I'm really interested in, was conveyed or was illustrated in the dialogue indeed of King Arthur and Sir Lancelot. Now remember with radio we're talking about an oral format. You're only hearing uh, the action. But Maxwell did not set the Knights of the White Carnation in the Middle Ages. <coughs> Pardon me. The script has a medieval context, and although radio is an oral medium, the format's limitations did not interfere with his ability to use verbal and oral cues to draw a comparison between a fictional round table knight fictional roundtable night of racist knights in the clan. Before discussing Maxwell's Knights of the White Carnation, an overview of American, Radio, American Radio's cultural world is called for. Radio was considered the agent of uplift and moral improvement from about the 1930s through the 1950s. This is considered the golden age of radio, of course, before it was replaced by television. For a majority of Americans, the radio set like the television, the computer, and the cell phone today was a necessity, though owning a radio set was not economically feasible for many Americans until the 40s. By then, approximately 90% of homes had a radio set. In 1945, 90 million people were reported to listen to their radio sets on a regular basis. Helen Cantrell and Bert Alpart, writing in 1935 in the Psychology of Radio, suggests that if millions of people listened to the same program at the same time were aware that they shared a listening experience, the radio became a powerful tool of democracy. Benedict Anderson would call this group of individuals an imagined community. For instance, recall the mass hysteria that was created by Orson Welles' radio adaptation of The War of the Worlds on Halloween Eve in 1938. This proved that uh, radio, the medium itself, had a significant impact on the listener's experience. While radio ruled the ether, most radio script writers, producers, and networks took seriously their civic responsibility to produce quality content for an ideal radio listener imagined to be white, middle class, and non-ethnic. Radio defined what it meant to be an American by promoting ideas of race, ethnicity, and gender. According to the radio network broadcasting code of the 30s, 
programs, especially those produced for children, were to promote democracy, equality, and freedom, and the law, values that could easily be linked with the anti-fascist cause. However, as we know, radio encouraged consumerism, promoted race and gender stereotypes, and pushed radical agendas. Economic and social tensions following the Depression and the war compounded anxieties and turned American against American. Radio proved a powerful tool for anyone who wanted to construct an ideal radical ideology. For instance, in the 30s, Father Charles Coughlin, the radio priest, and Louisiana Senator Hugh Long, who also was considered a Robin Hood, um, used radio as a platform to influence public opinion. Coughlin's rants against Hoover, communism, international banking, and the wealthy played into their hopes and fears for the nation. Both tapped into the radio audience's fears and prejudice behind critics to warn that they would Hitlerize America. Newspapers and news broadcasts familiarized radio listeners with the hate speech of Hitler and his obsession with creating a race of supermen by um, obliterating the foreign by obliterating foreign blood. In her study of American broadcasting history, Barbara Savage writes that Hitler's rhetoric resonated so closely with the predominant racial thinking in the U.S. that it created demand for a new language of tolerance. However, radio's foreign tolerance had an intolerance had a slow start. Howard Blue writes that when radio dramas finally dealt with the rise of fascism and the consequent outbreak of hostilities in the 1940s, it did so indirectly. Radio dramas initially avoided war themes or addressed fascism for a number of reasons, or addressing fascism for a number of reasons, including the um, US's isolationist stance and the network, network sphere of losing advertising dollars. In, in wartime, Radio was vital to maintaining a sense of unity. But toward the end of the war, producers of radio content were fighting homegrown hate mongering, and this is the word they use, hate mongering, with dramatic programs such as Mutuals, Mr. District Attorney, Big Town, and of course, The Adventures of Superman, the first children's radio program to join the nationwide campaign for tolerance. Maxwell framed each of the Operation Intolerance episodes with an anti bigotry message. Each installment opens and closes with a reminder that Superman, quote, defends the truly American principle of fair play and equality against a group of men preaching the doctrine of hate, end quote. William Lewis, the president and radio director of Kenyon and Eckert, the advertising agency sponsoring the program, expected it to be a socially conscious program that would pave the way for other networks to raise awareness. So Superman was expected to set an example. Operation Intolerance would send a early American message of brotherhood that inspired children to be friendly with all children, regardless of race, creed, or color. Maxwell could easily use Superman to spread his message. Between 41 and 44, approximately 30 million Americans, including soldiers, read Superman comic books or strips. Fans of the Superman series numbered in the millions. millions. In his history of Superman, Rick Bowers writes that during wartime, in print and on air, Superman crossed paths with the criminal underworld, but also with foreign dictators who followed a, quote, philosophy of racial and religious superiority, and whose quest for world domination included plans to conquer America, end quote. Superman's first appearance in 38, just as a background, was in the first edition of Action Comics. He was actually created in response um, to the prejudice that his creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, had experienced as the children of immigrants. Um, they envisioned Superman as a representation of the best parts of the American way of life, and he was meant to, the superhero, quote, to raise awareness of un-American attitudes rampant in the country, end quote. Superman was America's moral compass, an orphan, an immigrant from the planet Kryptonite, a superhero faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. In wartime, Superman described a term that demonstrated evilism, was a modern-day crusader, Quote, a hellraiser and insurrectionist, half Huckleberry Finn, half Robin Hood, the knight of Metropolis, and a flying Uncle Sam. End quote. Superman straddled past and the present as a permutation of British and American legend, a once American patriot, patriot, and a medieval knight. Superman, voiced in radio by Clayton Collier, by Collier, took on real world hate mongers in chivalric style, battling, battling neo Nazi thugs and hooded clansmen without pulling any punches. Chivalry, a medieval social, political, and cultural institution, had evolved from about the 1100s to the 1500s. The chivalric code was meant to restrain the warrior, both on and off the battlefield. 
As an ethical code, it was defined by the qualities, as I mentioned, of honor, gallery, uh, valor, generosity, and courtly manners. Beginning with the chivalric revival in the 15th century, writers of medieval romance embraced an idealized vision of the knight and associated him with courtly love. From the 16th century onward, uh, especially during the 19th and 20th century American and British chivalric revivals, chivalry became a standard for the gentleman. A modern understanding of chivalry is probably informed by our exposure to modern adaptations of our Arthurian romance, and especially Mallory's 15th century mort in various mediums. According to the Knights Oath spoken by Arthur, in the mort, knights were expected never to do outrage nor murder, always to flee treason, to give mercy unto him that asked for mercy, to do ladies, damsels, and gentlewomen, and widows succor, strengthen them in their rights, never to enforce upon pain, them pain of death, and that no man takes to battle in a wrongful quarrel for love or for worldly goods. This was likely the image of the chivalric knight of Maxwell's imagination and that which resided in the minds of the radio audience. However, the actual institution of chivalry was imperfect, an imperfect human system that divided loyalties. It could replace common sense and justice, especially in times of crisis, writes Mark Gerard. In his study of chivalry in the English gentleman, Gerard identifies one of the great dangers of chivalry as the ability to make people totally out of touch with reality and to turn, quote, chivalrous Galahads and Lancelots into white knights gallantly charging in the wrong direction, end quote. According to Nigel Saul, uh, his history of medieval chivalry, proud and egocentric knight errantry proved problematic as the profession promoted self-fulfillment and personal values. And this is what we see illustrated in Knights of the White Carnation. And the plan, of course, an organization that adapted but subverted the chivalric code and claimed to be a nonviolent, quote, law-abiding, practical, fraternal order pledged to wholesome service, end quote. And that's actually taken from um, a biography of the plan. As the first installment of Maxwell's program makes clear, Superman is, um, comes up against Vincent Kirby, who's on a quest to keep Metropolis pure by ridding the city of all, quote, foreigners, end quote, and this begins with the children. Uh, Maxwell emphasizes the contradictory nature of chivalry and of knighthood and leads to the planned subversion of the chivalric code. The name of the fictional group, calling itself the Knights of the White Carnation, recalls the various branches of the plan assumed uh, branches the plan assumed, such as Knights of the White Camellia, the White League, White Brotherhood. Second, according to an early biography of the plan published in the 20s, the organization's members included prosperous businessmen and lawyers who, who were also characterized as Knights of the White Carnation. Members were to, quote, this is from the plan again, perpetuate its spiritual purpose to make it a national standard, fraternal order composed of American manhood that believed in the preservation of pure Anglo-Saxon institutions, ideals, and principles, end quote. Plansmen swore to protect, quote, womanhood, womanhood, to maintain forever white supremacy in all things, commemorate the holy and chivalric achievements of our fathers, to safeguard the sacred rights, exalted privileges, and distinction, distinctive institution of our civil government, to bless mankind and to keep America pure, end quote. Notice the Klan's the claim to a medieval past. Although the plan has been driven underground, had been driven underground in the early 20th century, it reemerged in the U.S. Um, as the U.S. entered the Second World War, it was joined by other hate groups such as the American Nazi League, the German American Bund, the Black Legion, the Anglo-Saxon Federation, and the Communist Party. Even women, far from membership, uh, organized their own branches. Many Americans were growing, were growing sensitive to the growing anti-Semitism. Newspapers warned at the time that America, quote, needed to stem the tide of hate before the most acceptable among us are swept into the stream, end quote. According to Frederick Donald, he's a leading uh, scholar, writes on American radio. He says that America was now fighting a, quote, foreign enemy who was steeped in racist ideology, end quote. So it became, putting again, difficult for many to tolerate bigotry. <laughs> Secular and civic leaders mounted a defense against the plan, gathering forces from the American Jewish Committee, Council for Democracy, and the American Council against Nazi propaganda. So against this backdrop, the opening lines of the first installment of the Knights of the White Carnation probably struck a familiar chord. Quote, while Metropolis sleeps, an epic menace to America is being prepared to strike against the freedom and well-being of all Americans. End quote. Kirby adopts a racist rhetoric, directs his knights, Metropolis' leading all citizens, 
to protect the city and the U.S. from foreigners. Specifically, they want five foreign uh, players kicked off the basketball team. Kirby identifies these boys based on their surveys. Casimir Kaspulaski, Michael Kelly, Tony Rosini, and Bill Kaplan. Kirby's verbal attacks on the children, his violent, racist language, and the murder he orders more than likely remind the mature listeners of the hateful rhetoric of Hitler. Installment one of the episode opens with a description of Kirby's knights. Each man wears a conservative dark business suit and sports a white carnation as the pill. Initially, the listener might not identify anything significant about this dark suit. However, uniform clothing worn by individuals is, of course, a means of group identification. And in the program, the standardized business attire worn by the knights of the white carnation resembles the black uniform worn by the German SS. Maxwell makes other clever but subtle allusions to the Klan, as well as Arthurian legend. The white carnation parallels the Klan's white ceremonial robe and hood and is a symbol of racial purity. White also appears consistently throughout the more descriptions of clothing, flowers, and animals. Kirby and his knight are described as seated around the table and arranged with their reenacts Arthur's round table. Ku Klux is supposedly, again according to the book I've written about the Klan, a question of the Greek word Ku Klux meaning circle or rain. Maxwell makes a historical allusion as well concerning Pulaski, which is a reference to the name of the town in Tennessee where the Klan has held its initial meeting. Ironically, uh, Casimir Pulaski was actually a cavalry officer of Polish descent and a real patriot of the American Revolution. Um, so, in brief, Kirby accuses the four boys of throwing the game and racketeering, and so they're kicked off the team. Um, and all of this comes to light when Kirby points out the picture and the news story in the paper um, of the boys, you know, succeeding in the uh, the all the citywide uh, basketball tournament. So this is just a description of kind of how how Kirby sounds. It's kind of hard to describe, you know, for all the way you're hearing. Kirby's voice drips with venom as he points out that according to the listed names, only Jack Wilson is an American. Kirby verbally expresses shock and disgust that these names, quote, overbalance a good American name like Wilson, end quote. Kirby's rage is obvious in the tone of his voice as he encourages his knights to rid Metropolis of foreigners, and he uses that word over and over and over. And Charles Canfield, described as a solid citizen and wealthy industrialist, is a sole member of the knights who verbally defends his voice, arguing perhaps that maybe these basketball players are just good players and even better than their own sons. Kirby, of course, disregards Campbell's defense of the boys, and despite uh, his point that a number of American patriots were, patriots were immigrants, including Pulaski's Polish ancestor, who was also a general, as the, a general um, remembered as the father of the American cavalry. Shortly after withdrawing his membership from the Knights, Campbell reminds Kirby that the organization's original premise is lost. He joined the Knights to preserve the American Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and to quote, actively combat the influences of communism, fascism, and all other isms created to destroy freedom of speech, act, action, and religion." End quote. Canfield warns Kirby that he's dangerously close to becoming either Hitler or Mussolini, they began meeting in pre-war Germany. So Maxwell's criticism at this point, and his, his criticism of fascism would have been obvious to the radio listener. If you hear it, it's, it's very obvious. Behind the scenes, Kirby orders Canfield's murder and orchestrates further brutality against the boys, uh, against children, so Rizzuti and Pulaski. And they are beaten up so badly they can't perform in the game. Uh, consequently, he succeeds in getting all of the quote unquote foreign children kicked off of the basketball team. Uh, Wilson, the only player described as having the quote true American name in quote, is allowed to play in the championship. Now, throughout the program, um, you hear the difference between the Knights' behavior, as it's described, and then the chivalric behavior of Superman, uh, Jimmy Olsen, Clark Kent, Superman's alter ego, and some other male characters. It's pretty obvious. In a later installment, um, Kirby sends agitators to Ben Franklin High School, armed with inflammatory pamphlets to instigate unrest among the students. However, Superman slash Clark Kent prevents further mob violence when they warn the students and, of course, the listener about the dangerous, vicious language that turns American against American. So in each installment, the violence becomes uh, escalates in dialogue and action. Kirby predicts that within the next 24 hours, quote, red hot, murderous hate will sweep through the city directed against all people of foreign ancestry, end quote. Kirby's rant continues to the last installment and concludes with installment 15, 
and Clark Kent solves Canfield's murder and Superman captures Kirby and his knights. The final installment is actually the most interesting. Um, this is set in court, and it's clearly the theme of the Knights of the White Carnation. Kirby and his cronies are jailed and sentenced for, quote, murder, abduction, conspiracy to spread race, hatred, and violence in the schools, end quote. They're charged with committing crimes against humanity and against democracy. Okay. All right. Um, so just a couple of, of quotes here. Uh, Kirby is accused of failing to uphold his democratic freedom. He's failing to, uh, to um, be a good American, and he's actually sentenced to die in the electric chair. And so in conclusion, uh, let's see. I'll just put a conclusion to come up. So Maxwell uses the medium of radio to warn listeners about the dangers spread by such hatreds like the Klan. The Knights of the White Carnation employs our theory of the medieval tropes to call attention to a contemporary crisis. Maxwell engaged with medievalism when he incorporated medieval images and language into a program about a 20th century uh, group of racists. The Knights of the White Carnation and the Klan demonstrate the, quote, collective consciousness of the medieval knightly class, end quote, committed to fighting for a just and noble cause based on a, ra based on a racist ideology out of a misguided sense of social obligation. So I hope you got a sense of what this was about. <laughs> okay. So my paper is called Resurrecting King Arthur, an, Explore, an Exploration of King Arthur's Legend in Popular Young Adult Literature. Um, it's going to focus on this particular book, Meg Cabot's um, Avalon High, and we'll talk about what she did with Arthur and the legend there. So just going to dive in. <coughs> Despite our advancements and progression into the 21st century, we as a culture are still fascinated with dragons, jousting, and the daring rescues of damsels in distress by knights in shining armor. Yes, our, the public's view of Renaissance era is overly romanticized by what we read in books and view in movies, especially those centered on Arthur and his knights at the round table, but we're still drawn to that era. Something about the Middle Ages just fascinates us. That's why we're all here. I mean, obviously, we've just had. 60 some odd hours, nothing but Middle Ages, so clearly we're fascinated by it. Um, and I'm focusing on Arthur in particular. Um, it, it can be argued that our fascination with Arthur comes from not knowing the answer to the question of whether or not he ever existed or if he's just fictional creation. And scholars have been debating the answer to this question for ever. Um, People, um, Mike Ashley, to name one, say that Arthur is a work of pure fiction, while Jim Donaldson and many others believe that Arthur must have been a real historical figure because all myth derives from things that really happened. And then there are others who feel that while Arthur may have been real, he's nothing like the legendary figure we know today. Um, and uh, these academics and their peers however, do not explain the fascination that the general public has with Arthur, assuming his historical existence does not interest them. Interest them. Uh, Guy Halsall, on the other hand, poses that exploring the answer to this question is what sells so many books to both academics and the, what he calls the interested layman, and I'm quoting here, almost every bookshop in the UK has at least half a shelf of this sort of book about King Arthur, written by amateur enthusiasts, each reveals a different truth about the lost king of the Britons. All are mutually incompatible, but usually based in whole or part on the same evidence. Um, each, Arthur, each author fanatically believes that his version, and usually the author is a he, um, to be the true story, hushed up by foreign academics or by political conspiracies, um, or even sometimes that author's rival. Such book sells, no doubt. Interest in um, King Arthur is enormous, yet they sell not because the interested layman necessarily has vested interest in the argument that King Arthur was Scottish, Cornish, Welsh, or from Warwickshire, or even, I suspect, in whether or not he existed. They sell because people believe the misleading claims of, the, of these books covers. 
to reveal the truth or to unlock the secret. In other words, they want to know. All that to say, um, people, scholars, and the general pu pu populace alike are interested in Arthur's existence and wanting to know the truth behind the bandit on it. Um, <clears throat> There's, cer there's certainly evidence on both sides of the argument, but no firm answer has been universally agreed upon. Um, even during the Middle Ages, I found some sources that say um, Arthur's authenticity was doubted. Um, he has no acknowledged grave. There are no monuments dedicated to his memory. So if his existence was um, questioned in his own alleged time, then how are we supposed to believe that he existed today? And truthfully, the answer to that question doesn't matter. It's just not important. Um, because whether or not he was a historical figure, that's not what makes him relevant to us today. Instead, I propose that it's the magic of Arthur Smith that has allowed him to last this long. While his legends are incredibly versatile and there have been a vast number of retellings and reinterpretations since the Middle Ages, they each contain an embodiment of chivalry, the concept of perfect manhood, and a fictional revival of goddess worship. In other words, no matter how many times Arthur's legends are reinterpreted, the essence of the myth remains in each new version. Uh, Joseph Campbell, a forefront scholar of myth, once observed this, and I'm quoting here, Myths are so intimately bound to culture, time, and place that unless the symbols, the metaphors, are kept alive by constant recreation through the arts, the life just slips away from them." End quote. Um, so as much as new interpretations rely on the cruxes of Arthurian myth, his legend's vitality relies on our constant recreation of the story. So as stated before, we as humans cannot get enough of Arthur. Um, yes, it's true, if Arthur existed, his story is very different from the modern tale that we enjoy today. However, we still enjoy it. We're still drawn to it. Um, and Arthur is still very embedded in our popular culture. He's nearly inescapable. And interestingly, it's not just the adults who enjoy Arthur and Smith. His stories appeal to younger audiences as well. Um, Meg Cabot was able to capitalize on his popularity with a teenage audience in her arguably most successful series, Avalon High. Um, while she's most known for her Princess Diaries series that has lasted over a dozen books and two Disney major motion pictures, Avalon High has broadened into more markets. Um, Cabot's Avalon High first appeared as a novel in 2006, but after that it became a, um, it got a three-part manga series acting as a sequel that was released each year between 2007 and 2009, and then in um, 2010, it became a made-for-TV Disney film that reimagined the legend once more, even from Cabot's unconventional version. <clears throat> As we'll see, the continual, the continual presence of Arthur in our society has nothing to do with questions about this historical existence. Instead, there is something about this myth overall that, over all others, that appeals to us as humans. This is why we cannot stop approaching him, offering a new interpretation each time that allows everyone, the old and young alike, partake in the enjoyment of this legend. <clears throat> to understand the power and resilience of Arthur amongst all audiences, we must understand myth. Not only what myth is and what it does, but what it means to us as humans. Because whether we can acknowledge it or not, um, his initials are J.F. Uh, Berlin was correct in his book, Parallel Myths. Um, quoting here, our lives today are saturated with myth. It's symbols, language, and content, all of which are part of our common heritage as human beings. Fables, fairy tales, literature, epics, tales told around campfire, campfires, and the scriptures of great religions are all packages of myth that transcend time, place, and culture. Individual myths themselves are strikingly similar between cultures vastly separated by geography. The stories, end quote, uh, the stories of King Arthur definitely fall into what Berlin is talking about. Despite being a character bound to Britain during the Middle Ages, his myth has transcended both time, space and time to appear amongst all cultures around the world for centuries into the present day. 
Um, so what is myth? In overly simplistic terms, myths are stories repeated over and over until uh, they become woven into our culture. In reality, however, myth is so much more. Berlin would tell us that myth is a, myth is a shared heritage of ancestral memories related consciously from generation to generation. Uh, myth may even be part of the structure of our unconscious mind, possibly encoded in our genes, end quote. He would also say that, quote, myth is a pattern of beliefs, beliefs that give meaning to life. Myth enables individuals and societies to adapt to their respective environments with dignity and value, end quote. And then Joseph Campbell would even expand that definition further to say that, quote, the goal of myth is to dispel the need for, for such life ignorance by effecting a re reconciliation of the individual conscience, consciousness with the universal will. <clears throat> and this is effected through a realization of the true relationships of how the passing phenomenon of time to the imperishable life that lives and dies in all, end quote. Altogether, we can safely say that myths, that myths bind us together because they're a collection of our memories our collective shared past as humans. By seeing how these mythic beings were able to both find and create meaning in their lives, we can attempt to find meaning in our own. Myths are so deeply embedded into the core of our being that we cannot help but seek them out. They call out to us and, we're, and we respond in kind by repeating their stories continuously. There is no definable reason that explains the extraordinary linguistic afterlife of classical myth mythology. However, it is of clear, it is clearly of significance. Even without knowing the original source material, only these myths over any philosophical or religious belief system can claim so unshakable a presence in our modern <coughs> culture. Um, given that definition of myth, it's easy to blur the lines between myth, religion, and philosophy. After all, all three seem to be paths of finding meaning and um, a distinct part of what binds people together. Myth, however, should not be confused with either. Yes, they deal with the same kind of questions dealing with happiness and a meaningful existence, but myth has a longer reach that addresses all individuals, not just merely believe, not and not merely believers, which allows it to achieve a universality that, from the outset, sets it apart from religious communitarianism. <clears throat> um, and granted, that explanation would always separate myth from religion because you don't have to be a believer to have a philosophical mindset. And again, myth and philosophy both deal with ideas of realism, humanity, various social justice concepts. Myths are told in a more narrative form that moves us to wonder, that moves us emotionally. These narratives appeal to our feelings and our emotions, and we think about them as works of fiction or art rather than these philosophical essays that really make us think. Um, and because myths are believed to be fictional, we approach them with a different mindset, and they move us in a deeper way than philosophy ever could. Um, the way it appeals to all people universally on an emotional rather than intellectual level is what separates myth from philosophy and religion, and ultimately what makes it last longer as well. <clears throat> Beyond just move, moving us emotionally, myth is capable of doing so much more. For one thing, myth reinforces the universal belief of the circle of life, where all things and beings rise out of the dark and eventually dissolve back into it. Mytho mythology also provides us with the same essential quest, and this is a quote from um, Campbell. You leave the world that you're in and go into a depth or into a distance or up to a height. There you come to what was missing in your consciousness and the world you formerly inhabited. Then comes the problem whether of staying with that or, let it, or letting the world drop off and returning to that boon and trying to hold on to it as you move back into your social world again. And that's his description of the hero quest. But that quest, that path, that pattern, should sound extremely familiar to all of us. It is the epitome of the traditional college experience. It is what it's like to move out of your parents' house for the first time. It's traveling out of the country for the first time. When people talk about finding themselves or going on a journey of self-discovery, they're essentially talking about the hero quest in a much smaller scale. Um, 
Myths also give us the power within ourselves to see the possibility of reaching our full potential, our perfection, of reaching the fullness of our strength. Furthermore, myths are our, are our means of confronting human mortality, of facing up to our destiny without dosing ourselves with the consolations that the great monotheistic religions claim to bring mankind. In other words, myth gives us all the knowledge of the great truths of the universe, as well as the courage and strength to achieve whatever destiny we have and to fill our lives with meaning. <clears throat> that ability is what makes mythology so essential to our culture as humans. Without myths, we would still all be afraid and could not achieve what is known as the good life. Even from the beginning of civilization, myth was essential. Uh, Renslaw Bonowski observed this about myth, and this is a quote. <clears throat> It expresses, enhances, and codifies belief. It, it safeguards and enforces morality. It vouches for the efficiency of ritual and contains practical rules for the guidance of men. Myth is thus a vital ingredient of human civilization. It is not an idle tale, but a hard-worked act of force. It is not an intellectual explanation, of, or, intellectual explanation or artistic imagery, but a pragmatic charter of primitive faith and moral wisdom. Myth, then, is so critical to being human because it is the narration of our belief system, our moral system, and how we keep traditions alive. Without myth, then, humanity as we know it would disappear. <clears throat> it is essential, then, that we keep sharing these stories because man's relationship with myth is symbiotic. By retelling these old legends, they are kept alive, and as long as these myths survive, man is able to keep the essence of what keeps us human. Um, after all, it is, it is um, by myth that the youth have been educated and the aged rendered wise. Through the study, experience, and understanding of their effective initiatory forms, for they, act, for they actually touch and bring into play the vital energies of the whole human psyche. <clears throat> now, by that reasoning, all myths should be retold and replayed, having an equal relevance to us. However, I argue that with the exception of sugar-coated fairy tales marketed by Disney, King Arthur over any other mythic figure has maintained a massive lead in terms of popularity with the general populace of humanity. So what is it about Arthurian myth that makes it stand out still, even after all this time, more than any other mythic figure? And it's possible that simply being set in the Middle Ages is enough, after all, Renaissance festivals Tabletop, day, tabletop games such as Dungeons and Dragons, LARPing, and stories with sword fights, dragons, and the medieval feel are still vastly popular in our culture. Um, it is obvious then that the medieval era still has a lasting effect on our culture. So why not medieval myth in general? Why doesn't that work? Um, so. If, medi if medieval myth were the main appeal of Arthur, however, other um, figures would, uh, other figures of medieval myth would be just as popular, and they're just not. There's something particular about Arthur that appeals to us. Um, as you probably know, Arthur's Arthurian myth was first popularized by Geoffrey of Monmouth, who portrayed him as a heroic leader, heroic leader of Welsh in their struggle against the Saxons. After that, Arthur, Arthur's legend spread to a myriad of tales in numerous different languages, principally French, and by the year 1300 or thereabout, or thereabouts, all the well-known characters, places, and objects had made their appearance. Um, these stories, the characters, and events in them, um, had made their appearance in different cultures all over the world. Um, in these stories, the, there we go, the characters and events in them collectively form what was known as the matter of Britain. In this case, the matter refers to a specific body of material upon which um, writers and storytellers could draw. As we can see, however, despite being the matter of Britain, Arthur's popularity was known all over the world, all over the known world at the time. and. That was just by the year 1300. In the 700 plus years since then, Arthurian legend has easily become 
a global phenomenon, a staple, and a household thing. Interest interestingly, it was not a single version of Arthur that spread. There was a discrepancy in how he was presented. Uh, some, um, in some legends, he is, he said to come from a deity, the bear, the oldest worship deity in the world. Um, and that's not very so far fetched because Arthur is still believed to be the hope of the Britons, the once and future king who will return to restore the lost world to them. So godlike qualities isn't out of the question. Um, others believe that Arthur was never a king at all. He was just a really good military leader. Um, and um, more than just being military in the way he conquered, he stands out because he sought peace over anything else. Um, the legends of Arthur do not tell of a king and his knights out conquering new lands for the glory of the Britons. Instead, the myths say that Arthur and his knights um, defended their land and protected their people in the name of finding peace and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> in this way, Arthur is a savior. Legends tell us he was born into a Britain of chaos, greed, terror, and early graves due to the invasions. Yet he managed to rise up and become the emblem of, emblem of hope for his people in a seemingly hope, hopeless time period. Our third aside, sought the Holy Grail, a religious, some say fictional artifact that only the purists could find. Legends even say that one of his knights succeeded. Arthur was able to wield Excalibur, a powerful sword again that was only meant for the Chosen One. Um, many legends claim that Arthur was a man who brought Britain out of the Dark Ages into a period of enlightenment. And finally, legends say that <clears throat> Arthur fought for peace in his homeland till his last breath, having died in battle. And um, some myths even say that we're still waiting for Arthur to return and bring the world back into another period of enlightenment, allowing for peace and prosperity. So we can see that there's a lot of discrepancy, but we, despite all the contradictions, we're still retelling his, his story. So by that same thought process, it's easy to see why Arthur is our most important myth. He matters because he was a normal, average guy who rose to greatness. He was not a demigod like Hercules or any Greek hero. He's not blessed with magical abilities like Harry Potter or even his advisor Merlin. Um, some myth even claim that he wasn't even royal to begin with. So when Arthur started out, he was just like any of us, ordinary in every way. And that's part of the appeal of Arthur. Okay, gonna skip ahead to um, but basically, my point is Arthur is important because he's relatable and he's ordinary. Um, and that works for a younger audience because, I mean, myth isn't unfamiliar to children. They watch cartoons. Those are all mythic heroes. I mean, they're not as classic as some of the ones, but they still serve the same purpose in showing um, virtue, like courage and loyalty. Um, and even you have authors like Rick Riordan, who writes the Percy Jackson series, and the um, Kane Chronicles, and the Magnus Chase, something that I don't remember what the full title is. But he's reinterpreting Greek myth, Egyptian myth, and Nordic myth for, our, for a younger audience, for children, which is kind of awesome. But there's nothing really there for teens, because once you hit about 13, you're like, mm, I'm not so much feeling these things that cartoons aren't for me anymore. So what, what myth is left for them? And so <clears throat> the only myth that I really see being presented um, to young adults, the only myth that's reminiscent of older myth anyway, is King Arthur. And it's through um, McCabot's Avalon High. Um, Arthur works for a teenage audience for a couple of reasons. First, teenagers live in a place, they're in a place of life where they're dissatisfied. They want to feel they have a purpose and are important to the universe, but they still feel trapped under the rule of their parents and confines of high school. They're unhappy people. Um, Arthur 
was in a similar position, or at least the author they know, probably just from reading Sword in the Stone, or not reading, watching Sword in the Stone, um, where he was powerless, but somehow he got power and he got a purpose, and that's what teenagers want as well. Um, also, because Arthur is the bringer of hope, um, <clears throat> teenagers are just unhappy. There's a reason their stereotypes is being really emo and all sorts of other things. They're just angry people. So if anyone needs hope, it's teenagers, especially since most medical books will tell you that um, mental disorders like depression and anxiety and all those issues start appearing around teenage young adult years. So it makes sense they need hope. So Arthur, anyway, um, getting to the point, what she does is it's a teen romance novel, which is odd, but she puts these characters in a high school setting you have um, and the plot is that some of these characters are actually um, Arthur, Arthurian legendary characters reincarnated in high school students. You have Will Wagner, who's the um, who is quarterback and basically perfect, and he's reminiscent of um, Arthur. You have Jennifer, who is a really perky um, cheerleader, who is. Um, supposed to be Guinevere, and there's a Lancelot and a Mordred as well. And then the narrator, um, Elaine, is basically all of us saying, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. You cannot honestly tell me that you, a teacher, believe that all of these characters are Arthur reincarnated. He's a 16-year-old boy who's just quarterback. Come on, you've got to be kidding me. And so that's enough of a draw in um, trying to figure out do people actually believe this? Is this really happening? And uh, we could perhaps entertain one or two questions if there are burning questions out there. Uh, I have a question for Catherine, kind of inspired by Brittany's presentation. Um, so King Arthur is like this huge nationalist figure. Like uh, the British are all about nationalism. British figure. Um, so do you think the invention of superheroes like Superman is kind of America's way of building nationalism based on the legends that keep coming back? You can trace, um, well, there are actually people who write about Arthur and how he can promote nationalism in the States as well, you know, in our country. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that they're an offshoot of the, the medieval movies. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so, maybe Captain America. I don't know much about the other superheroes. I didn't intend to learn this much about Superman. It's more than I ever wanted to know. But just by the way he's described when I was reading the biography of Superman, I was really surprised that he was, you know, called a knight. But also, it wasn't just a superhero. Um, the detectives were considered white knights. Um, cowboys or white knights. Robin Hood, in some respects, conducts himself as a chivalric knight would. And... Um, that's kind of what I was, I was getting at. So this idea of the chivalric knight is part of our culture uh, because chivalric behavior has been taught to our, chill, our young boys and men. It's, you know, inspires gent gentlemen's conduct and that's part of, was part of this whole thing as well, this whole investigation. So it kind of built from there, chivalry and then how it um, influenced behavior. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. All right. Yes. Um, I just wanted to throw in one other uh, thought. I'm hearing both you talk about Superman, and uh, she talked about King Arthur. And I think another, uh, I think a lot of uh, modern mythology has emerged from movies. Uh, for example, Star Wars. Uh, I think Star Wars uh, has, has created a tremendous uh, uh, line of uh, mythology that that, that, is, that is really powerful, particularly for young people, for young uh, uh, high school audience. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, um, Star Wars actually draws from from being met and the Arthurian myth as well. Um, so yeah, I, I <coughs> that's uh, that's where they get their their stuff, right? Now with Arthurian legend, um, you know, children and adults were reading the the, no the novels, the the Mallory's, you know, Mort um, in the early days, and then of course we have all the adaptations. 
but there were a lot of adaptations of Arthurian literature through through the ages. And so, with films in the in the 30s through the 50s, especially during the 40s, late 40s, early 50s, there's a there's a huge there's a number of films that adaptations of Robin Hood and, and Arthur. So the younger viewers, the younger audiences, kids were seeing it on the screen by that time. Robin Hood too, Errol Flynn, in tights, right? Um, they were seeing the Robin Hood adaptations too. So it's always been in our culture, um, you know, in, all type, in all mediums actually, on stage, music, festivals, books, everything. So it's just part of our culture. Thank you so much. Join me uh, in uh, um, uh, congratulating our uh, supporting our